rush through it in case there's questions. So just like in the last lectures, you should feel free to, to ask me questions whenever something isn't clear. Planck, I think most of you know about Planck. So it was launched on uh, May 14, 2009. It's about the, the size of a, of a car. Um, it observed from L2 starting from August uh, 2009 and then ended HFI. So as we said, there's two instruments on Planck, the high frequency instrument and the low frequency instrument. The high frequency instrument ended observations after uh, five surveys in January 2012, and LFI kept observing for another year and a half until August 2013, and since then, uh, Planck is basically the, the measurement is done, but there's still a lot of work to be done in, in analyzing the data. The first data release was in March 2013, this was for the nominal mission data, which stands for the first 15.5 months of the mission. And the first full mission release was in February uh, 2015. There will be another release and another set of papers. Um, either, uh, I mean, it's supposedly this year, uh, but it might, I'm not sure, maybe it'll be early 2017, but we'll see. So far, the one thing that's been consistent about it is that the deadlines have always shifted. But um, so this is the, the experiment, the picture. And then we, I already showed you in the previous talk, we saw all the, the maps at the various frequencies. And now I'll just describe for you the measurement of the angular power spectrum, uh, the way it was done by the uh, Planck collaboration. Obviously, there's more to be done than measuring the power spectrum. You can measure the bi spectrum. You can measure SC clusters. You can measure a lot of things. I'll focus really just on the power spectrum because that's what we've been uh, discussing and where the constraints on the lambda CDM parameters come from. So just like we discussed in the last lecture, the likelihood is a hybrid of a pixel space likelihood. This is, again, this is a, a nice way to, a, a nice likelihood because we know the CMB is Gaussian to a very good approximation. So this likelihood is, is essentially exact. It's uh, expensive to compute if you want to do it at the resolution of Planck because you would have covariance matrices that are 50 million uh, by 50 million. So instead what you do, so this just for, for temperature even, and so instead uh, what you do is you only use a pixel space uh, likelihood at low L and then use, in the case of Planck, uh, fiducial Gaussian approximation for high L. So Gaussian yeah, we, uh, this is the part we saw yesterday. By fiducial, again, I just mean that it depends on some fiducial model. And as I said, you start with some fiducial model that you think is close to the real data, and then you can iterate, just compute your covariance matrices a few times. So compute the covariance matrix, uh, extract parameters, and then feed them back in, and eventually should be stable. Uh, so the 2013 and 2015 analysis are here on the on the two sides because there were small changes. In the first round uh, of analysis, uh, the uh, low L polarization data was not used, uh, it wasn't the, the Planck polarization data, but was still used from, from WMAP. Um, in 2015, Planck used its own polarization data from the low frequency instrument. You see here that the fraction of the sky that was used by Planck was substantially smaller than the fraction of the sky that was used in the WMAP uh, likelihood. And this was because of um, four, I mean, the dust uh, contamination by, by dust for the most part. For the low L temperature data, not too much changed between 2013 and 2015. So this is some, some pixel spaced likelihood at low L with slightly larger sky coverage in 2015 than in, in 2013. So I'm not describing in detail what the commander is, but conceptually it's one of the likelihoods that we discussed yesterday. Yeah? It has the same dust, but there was no measurement of the dust. So if you look at the frequency coverage for uh, WMAP and Planck, then the um, WMAP frequency coverage is from, so let's, WMAP has five frequency bands from 23 gigahertz to 94 gigahertz, and um, they're all polarized for Planck. Uh, the maps I showed, you saw that you have uh, data from 30 gigahertz to 857 gigahertz, 
but only the, the highest two are not polarized, but you have uh, the highest polarized frequency is at 800, uh, 353 gigahertz. And so the, the dust, we haven't uh, said much about it, but the dust intensity grows as you go to higher frequencies. And so while you, don't really, while you can't really measure it well with WMAP because you're missing the high frequency information, you can make very good dust maps with, uh, with Planck. And you see that in, the, in WMAP, so as you say, they have the same dust, but what WMAP did is they modeled the, the dust. So there was some assumption of roughly what the dust should be. And Planck uh, saw in their maps, I guess, that the dust is slightly higher than the, the model that uh, WMAP was assuming. This also is responsible for, for example, the shift in the optical depth between the two measurements, which is coming from these uh, lower likelihoods. So you can see, for example, from here, you have something like 0 0.089 for the optical depth, plus minus something like 0 0.013. Um, and for the, well, this depends a bit exactly on what temperature data you combine it with. And then this one, uh, if you look at it, can give you something like 0 0.75 and then they had slightly uh, larger uh, error bars because the, the mask uh, was uh, smaller. And so this uh, shift downward, I, I'm not talking about it later, but so this was one of the reasons for this shift was that the, you modeled the, the dust. So some of the, some of the optical depth uh, here is really from, from dust. I mean, it's not... Uh, so there really is some, some dust that you had to, to remove. Uh, and you can measure it with Planck, but you couldn't measure it with, with WMAP. So I don't know if that helps. But. Okay, so then at, uh, so in other words, I mean, this measurement you should probably think of as just a, a, bi a, a measurement that's biased to a slightly higher value. Does it make sense? So you have another question? I mean, Okay, and so then for the high L likelihood, they're at the, at the level of discussion right now, they're both of this form, so they're both fiducial Gaussian approximations to the likelihood. At high L, they were called, it was called CAMSPEC in 2013. This was by the, by the Cambridge group, and then it was switched to PLIC, which is by the uh, Paris uh, group. So these are, um, it's, uh, at the level we're discussing, they're essentially the, the same, and they're the, uh, I'll describe them in, in somewhat more detail now. So the, the high L likelihoods that are called CAMSPEC or, or PLIC, depending on, on the year. So CAMSPEC also is around in, in 2015, but the main results are uh, quoted for, for PLIC. So they're based on only these three frequency channels. So you have nine frequency channels from... Uh, 30 to 857 gigahertz for the measurement of the angular power spectrum. Planck only used the frequencies from 100 gigahertz to 217 gigahertz. Um, and then uh, you don't use the same L range for all of them. Um, there's a, two reasons, I guess. So the, at 100 uh, gigahertz, uh, Planck used uh, the spectra out to about 1200, 143 gigahertz out to about 2000. And then at 143 cross 217 and 217 cross 217, the spectra were used out to L of 2500. And the difference is that the detectors have slightly different sensitivities um, and slightly different beam sizes, different resolutions. This has a beam of about 10 arc minutes. This has a beam of about 7 arc minutes and 5 arc minutes. And so here the noise comes in before it comes in in, in these. So the, the smaller the beam, the uh, smaller the scales you can resolve, and so that explains this trend. And one of the differences between Planck and uh, CAMSPEC and PLIC is where you put the, the lower, lower end. If people are interested, we can discuss the differences, but for, for now, they're really the same type of likelihoods based on the 100, 143, and 217 gigahertz data. And then, as we said, you cannot use the full sky just because there's a lot of uh, foreground emission partly from our galaxy. So here this is the galactic mask. And here in the image, if you look at it uh, closely, you see that it's not a sharp edge, but it's uh, smooth. So this is what I meant by apodization, and uh, which is why we had these window functions in our formulas. And then you see that there's a bunch of point sources that you have to mask and uh, some uh, contributions from CO emission. And 
the emission, as you could also see in the, in the maps on the previous slide, the dust emission is stronger at, oops, at 217 gigahertz, and so the mask uh, masks out more of the sky at 217 gigahertz. So uh, you need the, you can make these masks. We can discuss in more detail exactly how you would make the masks in practice. Uh, they're made from the higher frequency data. So you might make them, for example, from the 857 gigahertz map and just smooth that map and threshold it at some level, and everything that emits more, you, you cut out. So that's your mask, and then you have to understand how you apodize. For the point sources, typically you have some detection threshold, maybe five sigma, seven sigma, and then, yeah, anyway. So then those are also apodized, even though it's a little bit hard to see. So you have the masks. And then even though you're masking, there's still galactic emission at high latitudes. So if you don't correct for it, it will bias your measurements. So what uh, Planck did was to uh, model the diffuse galactic emission or measure the power in the diffuse galactic emission also again from higher frequency maps and extrapolate down. So there's still galactic emission even if you're masking a fair amount of the sky. And then this part we already discussed. So you have an analytic fiducial Gaussian approximation for the likelihood. This was the uh, expression I showed in the previous lecture briefly. And you still need, in the formulas you saw, that you also have to know the noise of the experiment. And in the case of uh, Planck, what is typically done is that you take maps, either, let's say, uh, a map from the first half of the mission, second half of the mission, you take the difference the CMB and all the emission in the sky should be the same, so the difference should be the noise, and you can measure the noise power spectra that way. I'm showing them here. You probably don't care so much about the noise, but you do need it if you want to do the analysis. And so you see the green is the measurement of the noise power spectrum, and then what is done, you have some um, model with a few parameters, and you fit it to the, uh, to the noise. This gives you the, the Planck noise model. And then the, the green lines I'm showing here are the white noise levels that you give in together with the maps. So obviously at 100 gigahertz it's far from, from white and then the other ones are a little bit better at least at, on, on small scales but there's always uh, some, some noise in, in there that's, that's not white and you just have to take it into account if you want to have proper error bars. So once you have your... Uh, a covariance matrix and your, your likelihood, you then run uh, Markov chain uh, Monte Carlos, and if you run them for Lambda CDM, then these are the, the parameters uh, you get out. And um, so that's roughly how the, how the analysis works in uh, a somewhat coarse grained uh, point of view. And they provide, uh, so these, uh, this table you may have, I mean, it looks not too different from when we had, let's say, uh, WMAP. What really is new with, uh, with Planck from the information on, on small scales is that you're not just getting good constraints on Lambda CDM, but you're also getting very nice constraints on departures from Lambda CDM. And you see that Lambda CDM provides a good fit in the sense that the data always pushes you onto the Lambda CDM model even if you're allowing for departures from it. So for example, you might want to allow a departure from uh, a cosmological constant. You might want to allow the equation of state to vary. You might want to allow the, the running of the spectral index to vary or the, the helium abundance, the effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom, the neutrino mass, curvature. And you see that if you, if you run the analysis, you're always consistent with these. It's maybe hard to see from the back, but there's these thin uh, dashed lines in here that indicate the lambda CDM model. And you're always consistent with lambda CDM within, let's say, one sigma. Uh, for, for all the parameters. So this is something that you couldn't really have done with, uh, uh, with just WMAP because you didn't have enough information on, on small scales. So even though the parameters didn't change very much, we now have much more confidence that Lambda CDM actually describes the, the data that we have very well. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to say about the Planck likelihood. So now we've, saw, we've seen how you would derive the red curve uh, using, using codes. You should also have an idea how you would modify them. You just add the equations of your new physics to the codes and run them so you can, in principle, generate these curves. And you've seen a little bit 
how you derive the data points, you now also understand what this dashed line here means. The dashed line in the plot indicates where the low L likelihood and the high L likelihood are stitched together. So this is where the transition occurs. And you see here that these are not uh, a Gaussian, so you see that the error bars are actually clearly non-Gaussian. So this is the low L uh, pixel space likelihood, and then at high L you have the, the, pseudo, uh, the pseudo CL likelihood. This one here is maybe still a little bit misleading. This isn't quite how the analysis I described works because you had measurements at different frequencies and so at different frequencies you have different foregrounds. Here what's done is that a best fit fiducial model is subtracted and then they're co-added to, to make this uh, one measurement. Typically otherwise you have different fiducial models for different frequencies but this is what happens when you take out the fiducial models. And so now Unless there's questions about this part, I'll try to go back and say a little bit more about the um, contributions or what you're actually looking at here in, in the angular power spectra. So, yeah? Not the start at the end, but you can take, for example, the first half and the second half. Uh, you have, I mean, or, or you can take surveys. Let's say for, for simplicity, you make, uh, uh, in the first year, you make a map of the full sky. For, it's not quite true. There's always some missing pixels and whatnot. But let's say you make one map from the first year and then one map from the second year. Most of the things, I mean, the CMB certainly should still be the same. The emission from the dust, synchrotron, and so on, they should be the same. So when you take the difference, there are some things that you can actually see that are not just noise. For example, there's some scattering of light of um, particles, I mean, zodiacal light, I mean, scattering of light from uh, particles in, in the solar system. And that how, how much of it you see or where you see it depends on the, the time. So you, in principle, you can see that in some of these maps. But uh, for the most part, the things you're interested in are time independent. And so you can take the first year minus the second year. It should only be noise. And so you take a power spectrum of that map. And that's one way to, to measure it. And to get the properties right, you really take, let's say, half mission, half differences. Because the, the full mission is the average of the first and the second. So you take a half the first minus a half the second. And from uh, from that, you compute the power spectrum, and that has the same statistical properties as the ones uh, uh, as the the noise in the experiment up to so this gives you the the uncorrelated noise in principle there 's also correlated noise on the experiment because all the detectors are sitting on the same spacecraft, so the cooler is shaking, so there 's some noise introduced that 's correlated between them there 's in principle also ways to extract uh, that from the auto spectra. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it, it, the, the simple version is you take year one minus year two and take the power spectrum to get the noise, for example, or half mission one minus half mission two and take the power spectrum. More questions about the plan? Yeah? Um, there are certain, I mean, there's a lot to be said about uh, effects of cosmic rays on the, on the Planck data in the sense that there were a lot more cosmic ray hits than were anticipated, I think is fair to say. So the 98% of the, of the data are actually affected by cosmic rays of the time order data and then you fit templates to it. But I think there's no overall degradation of the satellite, if, if that's what you're asking. But cosmic rays definitely have to be taken into account. There's 98% of the data were affected by cosmic rays, and 30% roughly were thrown out because of cosmic rays or cosmic ray contamination. So it's an, it's an important effect, but not so much. It, it's not a large systematic when you take year one minus year two or something like this. Yeah? Well, Planck, I would say, did cover all the sky, but maybe not in the individual surveys. So if you look at the first survey, the, the first, so the, the way the scan strategy works is you have the, the sun, the earth, and then it's L2 somewhere, and the satellite just scans and scans as it moves around. So in half a year, it roughly scans the full sky, not quite. There's missing pixels in the survey maps. But once you 
take more than a single survey, you actually do fill all the, the pixels. I mean, if there are still... Sorry? No, it really depends on the maps you're using. So if you take the full mission map, there's, no, it's, there's not 3% missing pixels. It's definitely covering the, the full sky if, if you co-add the maps. There were some glitches early on in, in LFI from cosmic ray activity that you can even see by eye in the 70 gigahertz map, for example. There's a strip that goes across. So this was where LFI was shut down for a while. So there's some missing pixels in some of the maps, but it did cover the full sky. So it can't necessarily use the full sky because a lot of it is contaminated by foregrounds, but it did eventually cover the full sky. More questions? If not, then let's say a little bit more about the um, temperature and isotropies and the, the computation. And just to remind you, in case you don't remember all the formulae we, we had in the uh, previous lecture, the temperature perturbation was related to uh, the quantity uh, that we introduced. So this is essentially something like the, the density contrast. So this is the, the quantity that we introduced from the phase space density. So it was defined as, let me just write it again. So there was a delta of x, p, and t was defined as 1 over the average intensity and then integrated d3p, um, no, uh, p cubed dp over 2 pi cubed, and then the perturbation in the phase space density uh, with momentum p, p hat, and t. So this was the definition, and it satisfies the Boltzmann equation that it just inherits from the, from the phase space density. So this was this equation. And if we're interested at the temper in the perter temperature perturbation at some point, like our point, I'll call that point zero just because our cosmology is, uh, the background cosmology is isotropic and homogeneous, so we can put ourselves anywhere we want, in particular at the origin. And then this was, again, the phase space uh, density for the photons. And here, this was the momentum uh, of the photon. And the momentum of the photon is minus the, the direction you're looking in. Um, so this was the, the definition, basically, of uh, how we would get the temperature perturbations from, from this quantity. And we had an equation of motion for that quantity that was translationally invariant. So we looked for an ansatz of this form. So we did a, a Fourier transform. and uh, we expanded this quantity in terms of Legendre polynomial. So this was just some gymnastics that eventually led us to the Boltzmann hierarchy, which is convenient because those are the quantities you want to get the, the angular power spectrum. It, it looked like this, and then this part, you might remember, was just what we had also in our toy example for a free massless uh, particles, non-interacting particles. And then on the right-hand side, there's a number of contributions. So there's the contribution from uh, scattering uh, of these particles out of the line of sight. Then there's contributions from scattering particles into the line of sight. Then there are the contributions that tell you that the, um, uh, fo the photons are propagating not in a, in a flat or FRW universe, but in a universe that's slightly perturbed. And then this one we'll see is the, the Doppler effect from the motion of the, the electrons. And a similar uh, Boltzmann equation we had for, the, for polarization. And uh, for what we'll discuss next, let's undo the last step. So let's not look at the uh, Boltzmann hierarchy, but let's look at the equations of motion that are satisfied by this quantity. And it's relatively, uh, well, I mean, from the previous slide, this should look familiar. Let me not say it's relatively simple, but it is this equation. So you have this part that is describing the free propagation. Then this part, again, from, from scattering out of the line of sight, these pieces that describe the scattering into the line of sight, where this was the, the source function. And then you had the, the Doppler piece and the, the perturbations to the, to the geometry. And 
what you can do with this uh, system of equations is write down a formal solution. We discussed this already. Uh, maybe if it's, I'm not sure if it's obvious to everyone, this, this solution. Um, so maybe, is it obvious? Uh, otherwise, I can briefly maybe sketch uh, where it's coming from. I don't have it on the slides, but let me just briefly maybe say what the line of sight integration is. So if you look at this equation, so it's, a, it's an ordinary differential equation. So you have a, some, something schematically. It's of the form y prime. And then there's some uh, y here plus, let's call it p of x and y. So these are these, these contributions, this one and this one. And then we have some, some stuff, which I'll call uh, q of x. So this is the, the form of the differential equation, which is a differential equation that you've probably solved many times. So the standard way, or one of the standard ways to, to solve the differential equation is to first look at the solution of the homogeneous equation. So you find uh, for the homogeneous equation, what you find is that y of x, I mean, you just, I guess this is 0. Then you have the derivative of the log of y is minus p, which means that y is y of x0 times e to the minus integral x0 to x dx prime of p of x prime. So this is the solution to the, to the homogeneous equation. Does that make sense? Um, so this is a solution to the homogeneous equation. And then the standard way to find the solution to the inhomogeneous equation is to make this a function of x. So look for an ansatz where y of x is some other function, a of x times e to the minus dx prime, p e of x prime, again integrated from x0 to x. And then if you now take uh, y prime, uh, when it doesn't act on this uh, thing, um, well, let's write it like this. So y prime is equal one piece where it acts on a, a prime of x e to the minus x0 to x dx prime p of x prime. And then the second piece, when it acts here, it just gives you minus p times y. So by construction, uh, when it doesn't act here, it's a solution of the homogeneous equation. So you satisfy this equation. And then this is the piece that you want to uh, be equal to q of x. And now all you have to do is integrate once to, to get a of x. So what you get if you integrate once is just, oops. So what, well, let's write it out again. a of x prime is u of x and then e to the minus x naught, no, plus x naught to x, x prime of x prime, and so you just integrate it once, and you get a of x is a of x naught plus, and then the integral from x naught to x dx prime of q of x prime times e to the x double prime from x naught to x prime e of x double prime. So this is this uh, solution. This is the piece that gives you the um, um, homogeneous solution. So the solution to the inhomogeneous equation is just uh, plugging this part in here, so you just get y of x is equal, and then x naught to x dx prime, u of x prime, and then uh, here you just get e to the x to x prime 
dx prime p of x double prime. So you, you can solve the equation in, in this way. And this is what I'm writing on the, next, on the next slide. So this is the solution here. And you recognize the various pieces. So if you look at the uh, exponential, can you read it? Because I almost can't read it from over here. But so the, you recognize the various pieces. So the, this piece and this piece was what I called P. So you find those in the, in the exponential here. And then the rest of the stuff was essentially what I called Q. So this is the solution. It's called line of sight integration because it was a derivative along the, the line of sight. This piece was a derivative along the line of sight. The, the Q times mu is Q dotted into, into n hat. Um, now, if you look at the solution, then you see why it's useful because on the right-hand side, so it's a formal solution uh, at first because the quantity you're interested in also appears under the, the integral in, in various places, but you see that you only have L of 0 and L of 2 appearing, and so what you can do is you can solve the Boltzmann hierarchy truncated to a relatively low L, uh, high enough so you get delta T0 accurately and delta, so this one uh, consisted of delta P0, delta T2, and delta P2, so you want to have the Boltzmann hierarchy to sufficiently high L so you can compute those guys uh, with high precision, and then you can compute all the other delta Ls uh, using this line of sight integral, so that's what makes it simple. And this was a big breakthrough. So before people were solving the full hierarchy, it's very computationally expensive. This is what the, the codes now are using. Uh, it's very simple. And it's also nice because you see that there's really two uh, different contributions to the temperature perturbation. If you look at this formula, you see that there's one contribution which has e to the minus omega times omega. And this is uh, the probability of last scattering. So the probability of last scattering is this quantity times So all the first pieces are proportional to the probability of last scattering. No. And the second piece uh, is not. So the f I'll have it in, in more detail. So here I'm, I'm writing it out. This is the first contribution. It's proportional to omega times e to the minus. So this is the probability of last scattering. So all these contributions come from the time of, of last scattering. And again, we'll discuss them in more detail. But again, there's two uh, different contributions here. So this is the last scattering probability, as I said. And if you, one thing you can do just out of curiosity is just see what the power spectrum looks like if all you're including are these effects. And you see you get a fair amount of the spectrum correct. So there's some, uh, something that you more or less get correct on, on large angular scales. We'll talk about it more. And then on uh, the small angular scales, you also get it correct. There are some pieces that are missing, and, and we'll discuss them. But this is what happens if you only look at that contribution. In that contribution, uh, you will see there's two terms. So the first one uh, is from the intrinsic uh, temperature or density perturbations at the uh, surface of last scattering. Um, this are, these are gravitational potentials, so it corresponds to the redshifting. Um, I'm, the reason I'm grouping them together is because they are not independently gauge invariant. So often people talk about them separately, but they're not necessarily separately gauge invariant, so I'm grouping them together. And then here, this is the, the Doppler uh, effect, and may, maybe it's clear why it's called the Doppler effect. So this is the velocity potential of the, the baryons, or also the photons, uh, very, uh, very close to it, at least at, uh, at early times. And then this uh, Q mu, if you remember what the definition was, this is minus Q dot n hat. So in other words, this is the direction you're looking in. And then Q is the, the wave vector. So if you're looking in a direction, if the plasma is moving, um, along the line of uh, sight. So this is really the Q 
q times delta u is really the velocity of the plasma. And so if the velocity of the plasma is along the line of sight, you get a Doppler effect. If it's perpendicular, you don't get a Doppler effect. So this is the, the Doppler effect here. And again, this is the, the gauge invariant combination in the variables that I've been using. And if you plot them independently, then you see that predominantly what you're looking at, both on, on large and on small scales, are really the temperature perturbations. This is also something, or the intrinsic temperature perturbations and gravitational redshifting. This is also something that Enrico told you. Here you see it in a more quantitative way. And the Doppler effect is there, but it's, it's sub, uh, subdominant. We'll describe both contributions, but the dominant one is really the, the temperature perturbations. In addition, the second term was from the uh, was the one that didn't uh, involve the probability of last scattering and is a term that generates contributions at all times. Um, but it's proportional, so even in the absence of uh, free electrons, in other words. The previous term, you only got contributions from the surface of last scattering and also at, at late times from, uh, uh, from reionization. This term can generate contributions at all times. Um, this is what it looks like. So it's, again, relatively small. There's a contribution here at L of around uh, 100, 200. And then there's another contribution at very large angular scales. And one thing uh, that you can convince yourself, which is maybe easier if you work in Newtonian gauge, so eventually this is the Newtonian potential, you can convince yourself that it doesn't evolve in a matter-dominated uh, universe. So the, the time derivative of this quantity is zero when you have matter domination. And so the two contributions that you see on the previous slide, you understand come from, on the one hand, from the fact that uh, during recombination, the radiation is not completely subdominant. So there's, if you look at the evolution of the universe, at some point the matter becomes the, in the beginning, as we know from the discussion of nucleosynthesis, the universe was radiation dominated. It redshifts like one over eight to the four. The dark matter redshifts like one over a cubed. So at some point, you enter, you, you get to a point where matter and radiation uh, are equally important. Um, and if you go even later, then the, the radiation is negligible. The matter radiation equality isn't far enough in the past of last scattering for radiation to be completely negligible. So there's a contribution here. And then you also know that at very late times, the gravitational potentials will evolve, will evolve because dark energy becomes important. And that's what you're seeing here. So um, you can, so these are the two contributions. The early contribution when radiation isn't completely negligible and then the late contribution from dark energy, and you can break them up. So there's the, the early integrated Sachs-Wolf contribution and the late contribution. So now we've seen uh, the, the main contributions to the temperature and isotropies in the cosmic microwave background, the, the Doppler effect, the Sachs-Wolf effect, and then the early and late integrated Sachs-Wolf uh, Sachs contribution. And here what I'm showing you is just all the contributions that arise from the time of recombination together in, in blue, and then the late uh, integrated Sachs-Wolf contribution in green. And you see it's only really important on uh, very large scales. You also notice that if you plot the, the full contribution, not the one uh, from recombination, you see that the, the black spectrum, or the contribution is actually below what I'm calling Sachs-Wolf, Doppler, and early integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. And this is coming from uh, reionization. So if you have uh, the first stars form and reionize the universe, then the, the medium has some, some optical depth and some finite probability for the photons that come to us from the last scattering surface to scatter again. The probability for a photon to scatter again, or to not scatter, let's put that one, is e to the minus tau. And here we're looking at the power spectrum. So you expect an e to the minus two tau suppression from the optical depth on small scales. In addition to that, it's not, I didn't highlight it, but we'll see it later in the polarization spectra. Um, the 
uh, there's a contribution on large angular scales. That's the ad. So there's a contribution from reionization on large angular scales. So this was the probability uh, for a photon to not scatter. Uh, terrible English, but in any case, you know what I mean, probably to not scatter. after recombination or after what we call the last scattering surface. Make it shorter. So this is that probability and then you see this suppression in the, in the angular power spectra. And so this also means that you're on small scales never really directly measuring the, the amplitude of the primordial fluctuations but you're only ever measuring the quantity. So Enrico introduced the A sub S, so you're really measuring on small scales A times E to the minus two tau, and this is also why this combination is often quoted in the, in the papers. Okay, so are there any questions? Yeah? Sorry? On large uh, scales, it's really not L. On small, like large L or small angular scales, it's really an overall suppression by e to the minus two tau. This may look funny, but this is just really uh, what it looks like if you multiply by some by some number. I mean, the the number is smaller, so also if you multiply by, I mean, it's just the fraction of it. But the the fraction is the same between them. Yeah. How? Yeah, it's degenerate with a number of uh, other parameters. In fact, essentially all parameters are degenerate at some level with the optical depth, which makes it a little bit of a nuisance. So NS, to some extent, is degenerate with tau. Uh, something that's more crucial for future missions that I'll talk about in a little while is that it's, for example, also degenerate with the neutrino mass. And that means that we will, if we want to actually measure the neutrino mass, which is the, the claim that you can do with the future CMB missions, you actually need a, a measurement of the optical depth at a level uh, that was promised in the <coughs> Planck Blue Book, but it looks we won't really quite get from, from Planck. So optical depth is degenerate with a number of parameters, and it's an important parameter to, to figure out. More questions? Okay, so this was just the uh, pictorial way uh, of looking at the different spectra. Now I want to give you a little bit more intuition of the, uh, what's going on um, in, in terms of equations. So you, ha you should have them in mind. And I mean, obviously, I, I'm going to discuss the ones that are the largest contributions. In principle, you can understand all the contributions, but we'll focus on trying to understand a little bit better the contributions that actually dominate. And so again, we saw that the dominant contribution to the angular power spectra came really from the, the period of recombination. The late time effects are very small, so I'll focus on this part of the, the integral and uh, then what you can do. So this is the probability of last scattering what I'll do as a first approximation is to set the probability of last scattering to a delta function. So I'm assuming that all photons last scatter at the same time. This is something we already uh, assumed earlier at some point, and we saw it didn't make a much of a difference. It will make a difference for some of the modes, and I'll come back to that. But for now, let's assume that, and then let's fix it later. Yes, if you assume that, then the integral completely collapses, and you get uh, simpler equations. So you get, well, first of all, the integral over time collapses and you just evaluate everything at the time at which last scattering occurs. And uh, in addition, I'm also ignoring the contribution that was there from the delta P0, delta T2, delta P2, which are uh, suppressed compared to the, to the temperature perturbations. So in the, in the approximation we're using, this is the contribution to the temperature perturbations. And um, it's interesting um, 
to take it and compute the multiple coefficients. So go from t delta t to to the to the multiple coefficients, and this is easy to do. I mean, you can do it. This is again a one-line calculation that I didn't put in the slides. But the only thing you have to remember is the expansion of a plane wave in terms of spherical harmonics. So if you have a plane wave, e to the iqx, then you know you can write it as 4 pi and then sum over L and M i to the L times a spherical vessel function of the magnitude of this times the magnitude of, the, of this vector. And then you have y uh, star of q lm y of n hat, q hat, and l m. So this is the, the expression that you can plug in here. And then integrating it against the spherical harmonic to get the multiple coefficient uh, just uh, is very simple because it just collapses this sum. And you get this expression where you have the spherical Bessel functions. And the spherical Bessel functions are the reason uh, I went through the exercise of computing these multiple coefficients because the spherical Bessel functions have the property that they are essentially, uh, or the integral is dominated where, uh, at a place where the argument of the Bessel function is of order L. And this approximation gets better and better as you go to large L. So you see that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the multiples that you were looking at in the, in the previous uh, plots and the, the wave number. And the relation is given uh, in, uh, in, in this way. So there's a one-to-one -one relation between multiples and wave numbers, at least on, uh, on small scales, so for, for, for high L. Um, this is um, useful to know because we understand the behavior of the, uh, the perturbation as a function of the momenta, and it tells us that the behavior of the solutions we're interested in will be very different depending on whether the momentum of the physical momentum of the mode at last scattering is small or large compared to the Hubble rate. If it's small compared to Hubble, it means it's outside the horizon. We started with adiabatic initial conditions. It means that at the time of last scattering, it is still frozen, and we're really just looking at the, at the initial conditions. So the temperature perturbations for modes that enter the horizon after last scattering uh, really give us a, a fairly direct measure of the, the primordial power spectrum. Whereas for the modes that enter, uh, that are, have uh, a momentum that's large, or momentum at last scattering that's large compared to Hubble, enter, during, uh, enter earlier and will start to oscillate. And for them, we'll have to do a lot more work. The, the first class is very simple because they're frozen outside the horizon and we're just looking at their uh, primordial value for, uh, for the most part. So one interesting uh, question you should ask is where this transition happens. And what you want to know is where this quantity uh, is 1. And if it's uh, less than 1, they're frozen. Larger than 1, they're uh, oscillating. And if you just use the relation that we had before, so we had the Q uh, RL was equal to L. So I'm just substituting that into the uh, equation to write it in this way, uh, AL RL times the, the Hubble at last scattering. And then you can evaluate it for our cosmology, and it's around 60. And so you learn that in the, on large angular scales, so on L below 60, the modes you're looking at are uh, frozen, or at least the, for the, the contribution to the angular power spectra from the modes for, uh, uh, that were generated during recombination are frozen. There's some small contribution from the uh, late time integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, but for the most part, you're looking at the uh, primordial values. And then for the modes L greater than 60, the modes are inside the horizon and they're, they're oscillating. So we'll look at those two um, uh, one at a time. So for the um, frozen uh, long modes, it's very simple, as I said, because they're frozen. And you can write down the multiple coefficients. They become very simple. 
for the modes that are frozen outside the horizon. This is sometimes called the Sachs-Wolf approximation, where the transfer function is just a, a spherical Bessel function. And you can compute the angular power spectrum analytically in this case. Very simple to compute. And you just get L times L plus 1 times CL over 2 pi is the, the mean temperature of, this, of the CMB squared divided by 25 times the, primordial, uh, the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum. And this is called the Sachs-Wolf plateau, and it's also the motivation for actually plotting this quantity. This quantity is just constant on, uh, for low L. You can, in principle, I, I didn't write down the formula because it's not super illuminating and we're close to scale invariant, but you can evaluate this for uh, a general power law if you want. But, I mean, it's close to, for, the, for lambda CDM, it's close to scale invariant, so it's roughly given by this. And for the short, short modes, uh, it takes a, a little bit more work. I wanted to go uh, through it, but I realized it actually takes a little bit more time if one wants to do it carefully. But the uh, modes that one can study uh, in an analytic way fairly easily are the ones that not only enter when, uh, before last scattering, but also enter the horizon when the universe was radiation dominated, which happens a little bit before last scattering. And so these, these are the modes that are much larger than, let's say, uh, 140. And for these modes, so when they enter the horizon, is much before last scattering. So there's still a large number of free electrons around. And typically, what you want to do, uh, one way to so find analytic solutions of the system of equations is to expand in the momentum of the mode divided by the, the scattering uh, rate. The, Omega, remember, was the, these are the number of free electrons times the, the Thomson cross-section. And in the limit where uh, this goes to zero, scattering is uh, very uh, rapid and it's a, a perfect fluid. Eventually, this breaks down, and, but you can actually do very well if you treat this as an expansion and go order by order. Um, so this uh, lets you, yeah. So, at leading order, as I said, um, you get the equations of hydrodynamics and the solutions you have uh, are just sound waves. So you just have hydrodynamic equations. You have the sound waves that Charlie was also telling you about. And in this case, for the CMB, typically what's convenient, so in, for the barium acoustic oscillations, it's convenient to think about them in real space. So you look at an initial overdensity, see what happens, you see that there's this sound wave uh, that's propagating outward. Here I'm looking at it in terms of standing waves, with standing waves that oscillate uh, more slowly if the wavelength is long and more rapidly if the wavelength is short. And you can actually work out the solution analytically and it is of uh, this form where this quantity here that appears here and here is called the, the baryon loading. Uh, the three quarters, if you want, I mean, you could have written it in a different way where you don't have to remember the three quarters. This is also P baryon plus rho baryon, and the P baryon is essentially zero. And then you have P gamma plus rho gamma, which is four thirds rho gamma. So this is where the four thirds comes from. And then this quantity here is the, the co-moving sound horizon at the surface of last scattering. So this is what appears in the argument. And this is the, the matter transfer functions that you, transfer function that you know from other places. So I didn't have time to derive it, but I wanted to at least show you that they look relatively simple in the physics in, in a plasma. Uh, you know there are, uh, it supports sound waves, and this is... Uh, what you're seeing on the small scales in the cosmic microwave background. And the, I said we assume that the, all the photons last scatter at the same time, and I said that this introduces some errors for the, for the modes that are outside the horizon. They don't really care. They're not evolving, so they don't care if the last scattering is instantaneous or is spread out over time. But the modes that are rapidly oscillating uh, actually get averaged out if the uh, last scattering is not instantaneous. So this leads to, to a damping effect that's sometimes called Landau damping. Um, uh, in addition, as I said, the, the tight coupling expansion is not perfect and eventually breaks down. And uh, at leading order, this introduces viscosity, which leads to, to silk damping. This is something you can include and you get a, a damping factor. So instead of just standing 
uh, uh, waves, you actually have damped uh, waves. And so this is the uh, way the, the Sachs-Wolf contribution looks like. And in principle, the Doppler contribution, so you can solve the equations of motion for the density perturbation, for the uh, velocity perturbation, and you get an equation that uh, looks like this. So you have the contribution from the, from the Sachs-Wolf uh, effect or the, the, de the density perturbations and the gravitational redshifting, and then the Doppler contribution. And the reason this formula, I think, is useful, even if it's still somewhat long, is that it tells you about some of the dependencies on the cosmological parameters. So first, again, notice that the, because of the spherical Bessel functions, the integral is dominated when Q times RL is of order L. So this means the, the peak positions are set by, the, uh, by this quantity that's usually called theta, which is the ratio of the, the sound horizon at last scattering divided by the distance to the surface of last scattering. And this is, for example, uh, a sensitive probe uh, to, to curvature. So this is why the peak positions are usually used to measure the curvature. This is the baryon loading, which is proportional to uh, omega baryon. So you see that you have some, some constant plus an oscillatory thing. So you have, let's say, something that uh, oscillates around some, some quantity. So you have something that looks like this. If it's offset, the even and odd peaks will have different, uh, different power. This is, tells you that the relative heights of the even and odd peaks in the CMB power spectra uh, are a sensitive probe of the baryon abundance. And the, the damping scale is also uh, a very sensitive probe of the, the composition of the plasma, for example, allows you to probe the, the helium abundance and so on. So hopefully this gives you some idea uh, how the, the angular power spectra depend on, on the cosmological parameters and why you can actually use them. And I thought I would just put up the, the slide with the various contributions and I see if you have questions uh, about the, this part. And um, if not, then I'll move on and talk about the B modes, but maybe, so it's really a change in discussion. So if you have questions about this, maybe you want to ask now. Okay, so if there's no questions, then let's move on and talk about the, the B mode search. So you can write down a very analogous set, a set of equations for the, for the tensor perturbations. And um, here I'm, uh, it's written down, and you have the same kind of physics. So there's some, some scattering, and then there's some effects from the gravitational waves. And the, the source term now is more, more complicated. I mean, it's just because you intrinsically have a quadrupole, it's very easy to generate polarization. And here I'm showing you the, the plots of the contributions of the temperature uh, of the tensors to the various power spectra. I left out TE, but not, uh, not, because, not for a good reason, just because I wanted to have space to, to write something here. But for, for TT, uh, you see that there is the plateau, uh, let's say at L below 100. So this is what was used by, by WMAP and, and Planck to constrain the contribution uh, to, uh, of ten, uh, tensors to the angular power spectra. And then here are the, the uh, angular power spectra of uh, primordial gravitational wa uh, for the a contribution to the polarization of primordial gravitational waves. So there's the E-mode power spectrum and the B-mode power spectrum. And you see two features. One of them is here, this contribution that's coming from reionization. So this is photons that scatter again, and you have large scale correlations in them because they, uh, yeah. And then uh, here you have the contribution from recombination. So this is the reionization bump, and this one is the one that people call the recombination bump. And uh, different experiments target different parts of the, of the spectrum. So as Enrico explained to you, the power spectrum of primordial gravitational waves is of this form. So the amplitude is really just set by the expansion rate of the universe. And so a measurement of these uh, uh, primordial gravitational waves directly gives you a measurement of the, the Hubble rate uh, during inflation. And then if you use the, the Friedman equation, uh, 
it gives you a, a way to measure the energy scale of inflation. As Enrico explained, we really don't know what the energy scale is. If we measure B modes, we'll finally know what the, what the energy scale of the process is. You also see, so this R, you also have already seen many times, so this is the tensor to scalar ratio. I'm putting here a 10 to the minus two because, uh, well, A, it's a, a theoretically interesting number, and it's also something experimentally that one can do in the, in the near future. The one quarter is a little bit sad because it tells you that even if you put very good constraints, uh, upper limits on R, you're not pushing the scale down very far. So you have to put, uh, f uh, to get one order of magnitude in the energy scale, you have to push R down by four orders of magnitude, which is very difficult. Now, the R of order 10 to the minus 2 is interesting because it tells you, uh, as also as Enrico explained to you, that the inflaton must have moved over a super Planckian distance in, in field space. And this is an interesting, uh, interesting because it's something that's difficult to control in an effective uh, field theory. So I won't go into much detail, but the basic uh, idea is that uh, you take, let's consider some low energy effective field theory with a single scalar field and let's ask the question, should you, uh, uh, should you uh, trust the theory if you move the field over a distance large compared to the cutoff? So let's consider in, in flat space, so let's forget about the expanding universe for a second, just a flat space effective field theory with a single light degree of freedom and at energy is low enough so you can ignore the higher derivative terms then all you have to specify is the potential and you have some renormalizable interactions and then you have the non-renormalizable interactions that are suppressed by the cutoff of the theory and there's typically order one uh, Wilson coefficients that you don't know. So if you are interested in motions that are much smaller than the cutoff, you can ignore them. At the same time, you see that if you're interested in, in field excursions comparable to the cutoff, you would have to know these terms uh, if you don't know them, certainly you can't trust it in that regime, but you might say, well, maybe someone can give me these coefficients and I can then use it. And the statement is that in general, this still isn't uh, the right way to think about it because the field doesn't only have self-couplings, it also couples to some of the other heavy degrees of freedom that you integrated out. And if you move it over a large distance in field space, then the masses of these degrees of freedom might change uh, and get pushed below the cutoff, so the effective field theory changes completely. And I'm just trying to show that in a pictorial way over here. So you might have a theory where the psi direction is heavy, you integrate it out, you get some effective single field description for phi with a potential where you can compute all the coefficients, but if you move phi far enough, the system effectively becomes two-dimensional and you cannot really trust it. So um, the, the cutoff here typically is below the, the Planck scale, so having a field range that's super Planckian is interesting because it's, it, it probes the, the UV of the, the theory. The solution that's typically been proposed to this is to just assume that the inflaton is a field with a shift symmetry. That means it only has derivative couplings to the heavy degrees of freedom and doesn't affect their masses, or so the vacuum expectation value of the inflaton doesn't affect their masses. And then what you want to do, obviously, so if it's a shift symmetry in, in uh, the sitter space, which you don't want, so you have to break it in some controlled way. And the, the simplest examples, if you want, are Linde's chaotic inflation with a mass that's subplanckian, or the natural inflation models uh, by uh, Fries, Friedman, and Olinto. And in, in a field theory, you can just postulate these kind of things uh, but it's unclear if uh, uh, theories of quantum gravity respect these kind of shift symmetries. And so the detection of primordial gravitational waves in, in the CMB might actually teach you something about quantum gravity, which is one of the reasons um, uh, we think it's, it's exciting. And there was a, a short period of excitement where we thought that this had actually been detected. So this is the measurement from the, from the BICEP2 experiment where we had E-mode maps that were consistent with what you expect from the simulations and B-mode maps that were not consistent with what you expect from simulations. So there was clearly an excess in the, in the B-mode maps. Um, there's 
two obvious questions. One of them, if it's just a systematic you're seeing, this measurement is, is very difficult. So you have to distinguish between roughly 100 million photons. So the way it's done, the polarization measurements is you have a detector that's sensitive to polarization in the x direction, one that's sensitive to polarization in the y direction, and you take a difference, at least for this measurement, and then you want to be able to distinguish between 100 million photons and 100 million and one photons in, in the difference, so you have to have very good calibrations or just really observe a, a lot of photons. There's a lot of other things you have to worry about, so this is just uh, if you if you have a slight miscalibration, it would show up as polarization. The other thing is if your detector slightly point in slightly different directions, then uh, you pick up a, a gradient in the, in the temperature field. So if it's the same temperature everywhere, that would be okay. But we know there's temperature anisotropies in the sky, so you would pick up a systematic from there. And then there's also effects that pick up the second derivative of the temperature field, which are different shapes of the beams for the different detectors, and so on. And so you see this is some expansion. Uh, and there, there's lots of systematics. So one might have worried that it's systematics. It doesn't look like it's systematics. Uh, the second question was whether it's foregrounds, and I think uh, everyone knows that it's uh, unfortunately foregrounds what was seen in this map. Uh, but the maps are still useful because they're the deepest maps we have uh, still. Uh, these maps were 87 nano Kelvin degree. If you include the Keck measurement, then it's around 50 nano Kelvin degree. If you compare this to, to the Planck noise, then the Planck noise is a few micro Kelvin degrees, so much higher. Uh, the instantaneous sensitivity of the experiments is comparable, but Planck is looking at the full sky. Here you're just looking at a small patch of the sky, so you can make much deeper maps. If you want to get a feeling for what this means, then uh, a degree or a square degree is roughly the, your fingernail at, at arm's length. And so it means that the standard deviation for the noise is around is 87 nano Kelvin if you measure a, a pixel of that size. So if you measure a pixel of that size in the sky, you can roughly measure the temperature to, to 80 nano Kelvin. So it's, it's remarkable uh, measurements. They're very difficult, um, but it turned out that the foregrounds were relatively large. I, I don't want to go into the details of the foreground estimates at the time. So these were foreground models that we made after the uh, announcement with David Spurgle, Colin Hill, and Aurelian. And my goal at the time was uh, to really understand what it said about the stringy models. So I was working on the stringy models of inflation. I just wanted to understand what it said about them. The likelihood from BICEP didn't have any foreground model in it. So I wanted to make a likelihood that had a foreground model in it. And then eventually it becomes clear that you don't really have to make a likelihood anymore because the, this, the foreground is as large as the, the signal. And this was confirmed by the, by the Planck uh, measurement. On the one hand, I was happy because it told me that the naive measurement I did was correct. On the other hand, it's very sad because you know you're looking at the dust. Um, once you know there's more dust, you can uh, correct and use these uh, constraints to put uh, um, use these measurements to put constraints on the tensor to scalar ratio. And what they've done by now is uh, ruled out one of our old all-time favorite models of inflation, the M squared phi squared chaotic inflation model is disfavored um, now. And uh, a lot of other models are uh, it looks like they will be ruled out uh, soon. One of the things I briefly wanted to explain uh, is uh, here in this plot, it looks like the progress is somewhat gradual. So we've had these constraints of R is less than 0.13 at 95% confidence level for a long time. And it looks like we just pushed them down by a small amount. This isn't really the right way to think about it because uh, there's two ways the constraints are derived. Uh, for, as I said, for WMAP and Planck, they were derived from the contribution to the temperature data on large angular scales. And this was the plot that I, I showed you earlier. So if you plot the L times L plus one CL over two pi for the TT spectrum uh, for the uh, tensors, you had this plateau, and then it goes down. There's the, the silk damping. And 
uh, Planck and WMAP really were sensitive to the contribution of the tensors to the temperature data. So this is what was saturated. So you cannot really do better because we've measured those multiples where to uh, the cosmic variance limit. So you cannot really do better with that. But there's the additional contribution from the B-mode polarization. And um, the two likelihoods uh, are essentially independent. So you can make a likelihood separately for the temperature data and for the B-mode data. Typically, what we look at is the diagonal of that likelihood. So we're assuming that there's the same amount of contribution to the, to the B modes and to the temperature, which makes sense, obviously. That's the physical thing to, to do. But it, it's interesting to break it up because it tells you which of the data sets is actually more constraining. And if you do that exercise, you see that the upper limits from uh, uh, before the BICEP2 measurement from temperature were the ones that we have from Planck and WMAP at 0 0.13, 0 0.12 for a long time. And then uh, the constraints on the B-mode polarization where R was less than 0.7 at 95% confidence level from uh, BICEP1. And the constraint was completely dominated by the temperature data. And what has changed with uh, BICEP2 is that now the constraints just happen to be uh, comparable from the B modes and from the temperature, but these constraints will improve very rapidly. So if you just uh, go one year further and include the Keck data, you already see that it uh, shrank a significant amount. And there's a really, there's a fairly big effort in the US uh, to, to push down the uh, upper limits or to detect primordial gravitational waves in the CMB. I don't have time to talk about all the experiments, um, but there's a large number of experiments ongoing. So there's the bicep Keck array set of experiments. There's SPT, AGPOL, Advanced AG. There's APS in the Atacama Desert. There's the Atacama B-mode search. CLASS. Uh, there's Polar Bear, which will become the, the Simons array. Um, there's a number of them, and I'm sure I've forgotten some of them. Simons Observatory is something that was just announced. It's an expansion of the platform in the Atacama Desert. So it's... Uh, ACPOL and uh, Polar Bear eventually will join forces. And this was a, a 40 million um, uh, contribution from Jim Simons. There's uh, balloon experiments, spider flew recently. Eventually, there should be an announcement from them what they've seen. They had one flight with 90 and 150 gigahertz. They will have another flight. And then if you look out further, there's also a number of experiments. So the CMB stage four, I, I put it here as greater than uh, five years, but it's uh, fairly, uh, the planning is fairly active. So there was a, a call. Uh, yesterday, so we're actively actually talking about it, writing the science book for it, and it looks like at least uh, it, it might go ahead. And if you, if you think an experiment like that will go ahead, then actually five years is pretty early because you have to still figure out what the experiment should even look like. So we're still, it, the, the goal for CMB stage four is on the one hand to measure primordial gravitational waves, so put upper limits. Um, uh, on the other hand, you want to measure the, some of the neutrino masses, effective relativistic degrees of freedom, and so on. So this would be a, a, an experiment that should cover 70% of the sky at one arc minute resolution at roughly a noise level of one micro k arc minute, which is significantly lower than the, the maps I showed you. And then there's potentially also satellite uh, experiments. Lightbird is a Japanese mission. There may be, or there will be a contribution from the US. There may also be a contribution from Europe. Then there's Pixie, I already mentioned, because it would be a measurement that would go after the spectral distortions again for the first time in 25 or so years. It's difficult to do because the spectrum you're trying to extract is shown in blue here. The uh, foregrounds in the cleanest 1% of the sky are shown in orange, so you really have to dig into the foregrounds. There's also lensing. I didn't really talk about it much, but I mean, I talked about it in the context of the, the temperature data. For B modes, there's lensing. That you lens, so deflections of the photons generate B modes from the existing E modes, 
And this is something you have to remove. In principle, you can do it if you measure the emotes precisely enough. It's something you can uh, remove. And here I'm showing you what you can do. This is, uh, I can tell you exactly what resolution and so on uh, I used, but it's not so interesting. So you can remove a fair amount of the lensing, but you have to remove a number of things to actually get to the, uh, to measure the B modes. And you can also see why some people are interested in going after the reionization bump, because it sticks out. Uh, over the lensing longer than the recombination bump. That doesn't really make it easier because the, the foregrounds are very difficult on, on large angular scales. So we'll, we'll just have to see what's the best way. Uh, to pr predict how well this can do is relatively difficult because currently the foreground models are very poor. I'm just illustrating that here in this little histogram uh, and then I'm, I'm almost done. But so here the, the Planck data uh, is shown in orange, and then here are the various models. And you see that the models just don't look like the, like the real sky at all. So here what I'm doing is I'm just taking a patch of the sky and plot a histogram of the polarization fraction. So in each pixel you compute the polarization fraction and then just make a histogram of the, the pixels, and you get these histograms, and you see that the models don't look like the real sky at all. So it's a little bit difficult, and there's a lot of work going into understanding that better. Obviously, once you do these experiments, as I already said, you're not just trying to measure primordial gravitational waves. You're trying to measure a number of other things, like your neutrino mass. You're trying to constrain the, the growth of structure and constrain dark energy. This one is interesting if you're interested in, in fundamental physics, I think. It's a constraint on the effective number of uh, degrees of freedom. And what's interesting about it is that the error bars of CMB stage 4 are currently predicted to be about 2 times 10 to the minus 2. And that's roughly a contribution that you would get from a single degree of freedom that was in thermal equilibrium with a standard model at some point and then decoupled, assuming just standard model degrees of freedom. So if it's super symmetric standard model, you would double them, and then this, this goes down by a factor of two. So it's not completely model independent, but if it's just standard model plus a, a degree of a relativistic degree of freedom that's in thermal equilibrium with a standard model and then uh, de decouples, this is the kind of uh, thing you might be able to see with CMB stage four. So you can even do uh, beyond the standard model physics with it in, in, in principle. And so uh, there's a lot more to be said about the CMB, obviously. I didn't have a chance, for example, to talk about measurements of the bispectrum, and uh, I didn't have much time to talk about the, the secondary anisotropies, which are interesting for other aspects of cosmology, in particular in combination with the large-scale structure surveys. But I, I hope you learned something about the CMB and you know a little bit more about it uh, than before. And it's, the CMB has been very uh, a fun field to, to work in. It has provided us with lots of information about the early universe for 51 years now, and it will continue to do that for uh, another at least a decade, probably, uh, probably more than that. Um, maybe we'll detect gravitational waves and measure neutrino masses and, and so on. Um, uh, well, hopefully, I mean, the neutrino masses, I guess this is, again, so there's, one has to figure out what tau is, one has to combine it with large-scale structure surveys, and so this is where the large-scale structure surveys uh, really will play an important role also in, in combination with the, with the CMB, and I think all in all, the, the next decade it should be very interesting in cosmology, and I'll just end it there and just say thanks. Thank you.